Hello, my friends, and welcome again to the Parish of St. Anne's here in Toronto. My name is Don Barris, and I am the parish priest and pastor here. It's such a delight to be able to say that. As some of you know, this is my second weekend with you, and I tell you, it is a real joy to be with all of you. My friends, I thought it would be good to start our time of prayer outside. This weekend, in my reflection, I bring up the fact that in our tradition, we believe that God expresses God's self through the natural and creative world. That in Christianity, God, we can experience God through the creative world and come to encounter God in creation. And so I thought, why not spend a little time out in our beautiful garden on this gorgeous day? My friends, I invite you to enter into this time of prayer to pray with us and to be with us, to listen to the scriptures read, the hymns sung, and to share with me in reflecting upon those same scriptures. And my friends, I invite you to join us as well on Sunday at 10 o'clock on Zoom for our celebration of Holy Eucharist, and then at 10.30 for conversation. I hope you do join us. All are welcome, whether you are new to Christianity or exploring or just trying to figure things out or a person who's been in faith for a long time, you are welcome to join us. Now, without further ado, let us begin our time of prayer with the opening collect for this weekend. Let us pray. Almighty God, your son Jesus Christ fed the hungry with the bread of his life and the word of his kingdom. Renew your people with your heavenly grace and in all our weakness, sustain us by your true and living bread, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
When the wife of Uriah heard that her husband was dead, she made lamentation for him. When the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife, and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord, and the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. He brought it up and grew it up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his meager fear and drink from his cup and lie in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was loath to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared that for the guest who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. He said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. He shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I rescued you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your bosom, and gave you the house of Israel of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and have taken his wife to be your wife, and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house, for you have despised me, and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, I will raise up trouble against you from within your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this very son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. The word of the Lord.
reading from the Gospel of John. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, for it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to perform the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. So they said to him, What sign are you going to give us then, so that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. The Gospel of Christ. My friends, I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. One of my favorite authors is the short story writer and essayist Flannery O'Connor. A writer from the U.S. South, O'Connor is considered by many to be one of the great writers of the American Gothic style, a literary genre featuring eccentric characters and disturbing and unsettling scenes and events. O'Connor's short stories are among the finest of the form. What makes her stories unique, however, is the way in which she subtly engages the religious themes of grace and redemption. A devout Catholic, O'Connor wrestled with faith not only in her writing, but also in her life. Diagnosed with lupus, O'Connor suffered most of her life from the debilitating disease. As such, her faith was hardly pietistic, but a real and tangible faith that infused and shaped her entire being. I thought of O'Connor as I read our gospel for this Sunday, the beginning of Jesus' bread of life discourse as recorded in the gospel of John. O'Connor relates in a letter to a friend of a literary gathering attended by the essayist Mary McCarthy. McCarthy, at one point during the conversation, suggested that the Eucharist was simply a symbol and a good one at that. Infuriated by her friend's suggestion, O'Connor fiercely responded, well, if it's a symbol, to hell with it. Now, whether one agrees or disagrees with O'Connor, I think she was on to something, namely the tangible nature of faith. There's substance to our faith, it is not simply a sign or a symbol, but something concrete and substantial. O'Connor's words echo in a way what Jesus points to in today's reading. Don't look for a sign. See, I'm standing here before you in the flesh. Christian faith is an incarnational faith. We believe that God took on flesh in the person of Jesus and lived among us. Our incarnational faith is deeply rooted in the ancient Jewish understanding of God and creation. Creation is infused with the presence of God. All of creation is holy, and God uses the created world to magnify God's presence. 
There's a certain earthiness to our faith and that God uses very natural signs to convey God's presence. A rainbow, a burning bush, manna in the desert, bread and wine at the Eucharist. Marcus Borg, the American Episcopal priest, calls the Jewish Christian understanding of God and creation as panentheistic. God is present in creation, but it not is, is not contained in creation. The created world is infused with the presence of God. Yet we people of faith have always been tempted to reject the tangible and the concrete nature of our faith. Instead, instead preferring a faith that is more esoteric or something that can only be perceived with the mind. We see this in certain sects of contemporary Christians who constantly turn their eyes to the skies, awaiting some marvelous sign while failing to perceive the presence of God before them in the created world and in humanity. There's a real danger, danger with such a faith. We tend to reject the world as something bad or something that needs to be tamed and controlled and ignore the divine presence infused in creation. Such a faith fails to be open to God's mysterious ways of working within this world. It's no wonder we're now frightfully in the throes of a climate catastrophe. We've lost sight of the holy around us. Gerard Manley Hopkins, the 19th century English poet, expresses both the wonder of God's presence in creation and the terrible wrath that has come with humanity's abuse of creation in his powerful poem, God's Grandeur. His words penned well over a century ago speak clearly to our day. And I quote, the world is charged with the grandeur of God it will flame out like shining from shook foil. It gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil crushed. Why do men then now not wreck his rod? Generations have trod, have trod, have trod. And all is seared with trade, bleared, smeared with toil. And where man and where is man's much and shares man's smell. The soil is bare now, nor can foot feel being shod. And for all this, nature is never spent. There lives the dearest freshness deep down things, and though the last lights of the black west went, O oh morning at the brown brink eastward springs because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast and with all bright wings. It seems to me that Jesus points the crowd to the reality of God's presence in today's gospel lesson from John. The crowds catch up to Jesus hoping he will work some wonder or sign yet they fail to see Jesus for who he really is. They don't expect God to manifest God's self in a real human person who has real emotions and likely looked and smelled like them. Instead, they want something magical, something beyond the created world. They want Jesus to perform a miracle, yet the miracle is already before their eyes, embodied in real flesh and blood. I think we also fail, fall into the same temptation at various times in our life, or at least I know I do. Often when I'm confronted with some great difficulty or need, I find myself naively praying to God for a sign or a miracle. Yet I always find myself later on seeing that God was before me all the long in the people and the world around me. I felt this in a very intimate way a couple of years ago when I was diagnosed with cancer. 
As can be expected with such a diagnosis, I was terrified, afraid, and yearned for some answer and resolution to my illness. Strangely, as I was undergoing treatment, I began to see and feel God in very real and tangible ways. The family and friends who walked with me during that time, the other patients who I spent countless hours with waiting for one appointment or another. Most of all, when I tasted the Eucharistic bread brought to me by a priest friend of mine as I was recovering, I needed that. I needed something tangible and real, something that I could depend upon. Many are tempted to hear Jesus' assurance to us that he is the bread of life as metaphorical. I fear, however, that such an interpretation forgets the incarnational nature of our faith. Jesus is not just another nice guy. He is God made flesh in the world. Such an interpretation also overlooks the way Jesus describes himself. I am the bread of life. On their own, the words I am may be nothing more than a mere introduction. But John has Jesus repeatedly use this phrase, perhaps, perhaps, echoing God's revelation of God's self to Moses in the book of Exodus as, I am who I am. His further testament that whoever comes to me will never be hungry and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty further expresses his divine nature as the Holy One of God. He is the one for whom the world will find its true sustenance and life. Yet there's a third and more important reason for rejecting the metaphorical argument, the sacramental nature of bread. Our eating and taking of the bread as a concrete and tangible sign of the grace of God sustaining and uplifting us in our life. By affirming that Jesus is the true bread of life and our very sustenance, we admit our need for God and understand that we can, cannot sustain ourselves with our own efforts. There's a certain humility in this, an admission that we need God. And once again, we find ourselves returning to the earth, not only with the grains of wheat that form the bread, but also in our humble act of depending upon Jesus for our life. Humility, as some of you may know, comes from the Latin word humilis, meaning from the earth. A humble faith is a faith that is grounded in God, in God's creation. My friends, I invite you to come to the banquet and come to the table to be fed with the bread of life. In a short time, we will reopen the doors of our church for public worship. We've been separated far too long from one another and from the very bread that gives us life. I invite you to come and share with us in worship as you are able and feel safe to do. Come meet Christ in the people gathered and in the bread broken. Let us all together admit our dependence upon the one who gives us life the living God, Jesus Christ. Amen.
In the time after Pentecost, may the breath of the Holy Spirit enliven and renew our parish as we welcome our pastor, Don Byers. Like the apostles, may we at St. Anne's be open to fresh challenges and to new ways of living our commitment to each other. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us continue to pray for those who have safeguarded our lives during the pandemic. Let us pray that vaccines will be available for all, both in Canada and throughout the world. May the Holy Spirit inspire us to find creative paths toward a just economic recovery for our city. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray to the Holy Spirit that we may discern her gifts given to us for the building of God's kingdom. May the flame of creativity inspire artists in every field, men and women of science, farmers, office workers, and laborers. May all work be blessed in God's eyes. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As the mystical body of Christ, pray that we may embrace every race, religion, and nation as beloved members of God's kingdom. Let us pray for the leaders of Canada and of the world and for the work of peace and reconciliation. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As the apostles received the gifts of tongues, let us ask the Holy Spirit for the gift of listening to the stories which haunt our city in the words of immigrants and refugees, of those without homes, and those who bear painful emotional burdens. Let us listen and respond with care and attention. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us contemplate with awe and wonder the mystery of creation, from the starry heavens to the humble life of plants. In the season of rebirth, let us pray for all nesting birds and animals with their young. May their revelation of God's love inspire us to protect and care for the natural world. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer.
Hello, St. Dan's parishioners. This week, I know I speak for all of us in extending a welcome greeting for the second week in a row to Don Byers, our new priest in charge. He had a sterling first week and we threw him right into the mix with an orientation with the wardens and uh, David Gard, our treasurer, to uh, get the lay of the land in our parish and all the positive things we have been doing and we might be doing with him. And one of them, of course, is opening through some in-churches hybrid worship, that being uh, having in-person Eucharist in the church and still streaming, live streaming, and posting recordings with Zoom interaction. There's quite a bit, so there will need to be a few volunteers on August 15th, looking for servers, greeters, readers, Zoom deacons, and uh, I guess the, the cinematography and uh, video uh, sound people. Anyways, I'm one of them. So uh, keep thinking about how you may contribute to this uh, ministry as we grow it and see what back in church life can be like within COVID restrictions. That's about it for this week, I think. Or is it? Dave, you forgot something. What's that? Well, there's the FaithWorks Gameathon on Friday, August the 20th, and we're doing some more fundraising with by playing games for eight hours. Oh, yeah. We're oh, looking yeah. for pledges and gamesters. Right. We have five of eight gamesters we need, and if each of the eight gamesters were to raise $50, that's like five people sponsoring at $2 an hour, the math works out to about $500 that would meet our uh, target for FaithWorks. So I'm sure you're going to uh, hear more from Arlene in the coming week or two. But in the meantime, please uh, contact any of the wardens or, or Arlene herself to get on the team or to sponsor somebody. Thanks a lot and have a good week. Well, once again, my friends, it is such a delight to be able to share in this time of prayer and worship with you. I hope you found this time of music, readings, and reflection meaningful and helpful to you as you continue on your daily life. My friends, I invite you to join us on Sunday for our Zoom Eucharist at 10 o'clock, so you can join us by visiting the link on our website for Zoom to be able to share in Eucharist and to join us at 1030 for our conversation also at the same link on Zoom. I hope you do join us for it. It's a wonderful way to be able to see your friends from St. Anne's and to be able to pray together and get to hear each other's thoughts on the readings. My friend, as you like, likely saw this weekend, we announced, the wardens and I announced, that we will be returning to in-person worship on Sunday, August 15th. We are delighted to be able to open the doors of this wonderful church to you all again, and to be able to welcome you in person to share worship with us. We will resume celebrating Eucharist at 10.30 on Sunday, August 15th, again here at the church, and all are welcome. Now I know not everyone may feel safe or ready to return to in-person worship so know that we will continue our zoom discussion following worship at 11:30, and we will still offer these weekly videos i'm so grateful to everyone who spent so much time helping us put these together including thomas again my friends know my prayers and blessings for all of you may god keep you may god bless you and may God let his face shine upon you always. Take care and God bless.